We're going to start on chapter 5 today. I hope you guys were able to pull down those notes off Carmen. Um, here in chapter 5 we're talking about something called joint probability distributions and random samples. So we'll start off with the joint probability distributions. And just as a little bit of an intro, um, kind of thinking back to what we've talked about in actually all three chapters so far in this course, but definitely chapter 3 and 4, we've talked about just a single random variable, right? So a single discrete random variable or a um, single continuous random variable, and we, we talked a lot of details about, about those, those types of situations. Uh, but you also, you could imagine many cases where you would want to consider more than one random variable. So um, considering a couple things at the same time, right? So maybe something like height and weight, or um, if you're looking at vehicles, maybe fuel consumption as, as well as average speed traveled, um, time until failure for two different components instead of just one, um, and many other, many other examples. And so uh, this is a very, very common situation. So uh, we can talk about we're now going to have ordered pairs of random variables, x and y. Um, and for the purpose of this class, uh, we'll, we'll talk about only cases where x and y are either both discrete or both continuous. So of course, in real life, you could have uh, a mixture of some sort like that, but we won't, we won't talk, about that, talk about that at all. Um, so I wanted to give you some pictures here to think about. So uh, this is before we jump into the first part of the notes here. Um, so let's say we're talking about height and weight here and say I have um, maybe a thousand subjects. So I've taken a thousand Ohio State students and I've asked them their height and their weight and this is very unrealistic numbers probably. <laughs> um, but I, I could say that, so, so if we were talking back in chapter four I might have said that the, the distribution of weights is going to be a normal distribution with, with mean 160 and, and um, standard deviation or variance four squared. Um, the distribution of heights maybe is, is also normally distributed with a certain mean and variance as well. And there's the, the density curves that we've seen before and maybe I've overlaid a histogram of the actual um, of those 1,000 observations. Um, so, so back in chapter four, down here at the bottom, we, we could, have asked, could have answered questions like, you know, what's the probability that a randomly selected person weighs less than 155 pounds? Or what's the probability that a person is between 65 and 70 inches? Um, all those kind of things. We, we, knowing that we have normal distributions, we, we talked about how we could calculate those kind of things. And so still here, we're not, we're not comparing, we're not looking at these things together. We're just looking at them separately. We're looking at height, and then we're looking at weight. Um, but again, you could, you could kind of, the question you might also think about is sort of what's, what's, the, joint, what's the joint behavior of each person's height and weight? So if you, um, here, this is, a, this is a scatter plot over here. Everybody seen a scatter plot before? So it's just a way of representing two, two variables instead of one. So, so each point here represents somebody's height and somebody's, somebody's weight. So that person there is about 157 pounds and 61 inches tall. Um, and so that kind of shows us the, the joint, some, some, in some way the joint behavior of these, of these random variables. And so then you think about a question, maybe you're interested in something about both someone's height and weight. Like what's the probability that a person is taller than 68 inches and weighs less than 165 or, or whatever. That's just an example. Um, so in this chapter, we're going we're gonna to think about how to answer, answer these types of questions where we're looking at sort of this joint behavior between these two random variables. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of where we're going. Yeah, and the, the numbers are probably not at all, not at all close here. What's that? Oh, uh, yep. It's a tall person, isn't it? <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> Wait. You guys are good at keeping me honest. I appreciate that. <laughs> all right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I was very, very attentive at, at 8 in the morning. <laughs> okay, so, so jumping into the, uh, so that was sort of just a motivating example to think about where, where we want to go here in this chapter. Um, jumping in here at the, the top of page 1 on your notes, chapter 5 here. Uh, so let's start, off with, uh, let's start off with two discrete random variables, kind of like we did back in chapter 3. Um, but now we have two of them, so x and y are, are two discrete random variables. Um, defined on some sample space. Uh, and then we have something called the joint probability mass function and it's defined as following. So 
Um, in this chapter, we're going to start seeing a lot of the same things that we've seen before, uh, just presented here for, now for two random variables, so hopefully it's starting to feel a little more familiar. Um, anyway, the, the probability mass, the joint probability mass function here, we're still using that lowercase uh, letter p. And that's just the probability that one random variable equals x and the other one equals y. Um, so lowercase, so the probability that one of my random variables equals some, some, little, uh, some value little x and, some, and y equals some value little y there. Um, and just to, just to point out that when, when we're writing this out in probability notation, um, sort of a comma is equivalent to an and symbol. Um, so that's sort of a, e either, one, either way you want to write that is, is fine. Of course, you could also have an intersection in there as well. And so then, uh, just like just like back in chapter three, we have to we want to make sure that this this thing is is always bigger than or equal to zero. And if you sum over all possible values of x and all possible values of y, you get one. Uh, so that's the same same idea as we saw before. Uh, that's that's how we know that we have a valid joint probability mass function here, as long as it's always positive and or non-negative and, and sums to one. Okay, so that's that's in general, but uh, for a specific uh, for a specific set A, so um, that could be any set just consisting of different pairs of values for for x and y. Um, if I want to know the probability that my sort of that my joint distribution for x and y is is in that is in that set A, then I can just sum over all values of x and y that are in that set A to uh, figure out what that probability is, and so. Again, kind of very, very general notation at this point. Um, I think it kind of will make sense when we look at an example here in just a minute. Um, but, but same idea. If I want to know that, for example, back in chapter three, we looked at the probability that x was between one and four. I just added up all the values from one to four. So now maybe I'm looking at a set that involves both x and y. I'm just adding up all the probabilities over over that set. So the same idea as what what we've seen before. Okay, so a simple example to start things off here. Um, talking about a restaurant here, and maybe anybody has a big date tonight for Valentine's Day. Um, suppose that this restaurant serves, oh, there's no response to that. Maybe I just missed it. Um, so this restaurant serves uh, three dinner options, so uh, they're prefixed um, prices uh, 12, 15, and 20 dollars, and for a randomly selected couple um, dining at this restaurant. Um, <laughs> We'll say that X is the cost of the, of the man's dinner and Y is the cost of the woman's dinner. And then we have a joint probability mass function uh, as follows here. So for each, for each dinner, there's three, three pricing options. And then we have some probabilities listed there for each, for each combination. OK, so keeping your eye on that table um, can answer a similar question as we've done before. What's the probability that both dinners cost $15? Um, so this is kind of going back to our notation. Uh, this we want the probability that both dinners are fifteen dollars. Uh, which is putting this in terms of our random variables x and y. This is the, we want the probability that x equals fifteen and y equals fifteen. And again, this comma means means and. So I want the probability that x equals 15 and the probability that y equals 15. So in our other notation, this could be a lowercase p of 15 and 15, the joint, the joint probability mass function. And then, of course, it's pretty obvious, right? So we just find the, the row that x is 15 and the column that x is 15. And we have a 0.1 probability of, of being in that, in that situation. So this is just point 0.1. Okay, <clears throat> pretty straightforward. Um, let's one more question here. For now, what's the probability that both dinners cost at most fifteen dollars each? So, in terms of x and y, what what? How can I write that? Write that out. So, the probability that x is less than or equal to fifteen, and y is also less than or equal to fifteen. Right. So, I want the prob so for x and y, I want them both to be less than or equal to 15. Um, 
And again, kind of thinking about specifically what this what this represents, the set that we're um, talking about. This is the probability that that the ordered pair x y is equal to um, one of the following. So it's either they're both twelve dollars. Uh, one is twelve, the other is fifteen. One is fifteen, the other is twelve, and they're both fifteen. So a bunch of ors between each of those. So either the ordered pairs, they're both 12, or one's 12 and one's 15. Um, so being a little bit overly specific with writing this out, but again, it kind of you could kind of see where we're going with this. Um, what part of the table do I want to add up here? Yeah, I just want to add up all the probabilities that x and y together are less than or equal to 15. So. Again, kind of being very formal with notation, but this is just um, probability mass function of 12, 12. So I want to add up these four probabilities, um, which is 0 0.05, 0 0.05. And if I add all those up, I have um, 0.25. So the probability that both dinners are less than uh, or at most $15 is just 25%. Yes? What would the graph of that distribution look like? Good question. What would the graph of the distribution look like was the question. Um, well, so so this... So we'd be graphing, be graphing the probability, right? Um, and so now, and that's a two-dimensional function. So you have um, two inputs, and then a third is the probability. So x equals 15, y equals 12, and then I have a probability of that. So it would be a three-dimensional, three-dimensional graph. So you'd have like an xy plane of whatever values um, that have positive probability, and then the height of that thing would be the probability. So before we looked at... Would it still be like a step function or would it, I guess it would be tough to visualize? It would be tough to visualize, yeah. Um, if you're talking about the CDF, then then yeah, it would still be some sort of a step function in this case. Um, again, since it is, since it would be like a three-dimensional kind of thing, we're not, we won't, um, we won't talk too much about that. Um, but I think it maybe looks, it'll make, maybe have a little bit more of a connection for the continuous random variables. Think about kind of what the what the joint probability density function at that point looks like, um, but again, it's a we have two two inputs going into this thing, so the and then the probability is sort of the the height of that two dimensional that, that three dimensional plot. So yeah, it's a little little harder. It gets gets harder to visualize at this point. <laughs> Good question. Okay. So that's the, the joint distribution that uh, we can talk about, the joint behavior of those random variables, and either we'll have some sort of a function or we'll be given a table like you just looked at for a discrete thing. Um, so that's, that's the first thing to talk about is the joint distribution. Next, we can talk about the, the marginal probability mass functions. Um, so we have one for both of our a marginal PMF for x and a marginal PMF for y. And um, this is kind of like taking a two-dimensional, uh, a, a uh, two random variables and going back to just one. Uh, so the prob marginal probability mass function of x is kind of going back to the situation that we saw before and we're just going to sum over um, sum over all possible values of y that uh, to sort of get rid of that from our from the probability mass function. Um, and similarly for, for y you can do that, that for x. Um, and so for a marginal for a marginal prob for a, for a uh, discrete Random variable here, this is going to involve kind of like summing over the columns or the rows uh, for that table that we just looked at. Um, but again, the, the point is that it's a marginal distribution. It involves, it involves only one of our random variables. So the joint, the joint PMF talks about both of them. Um, the marginal PMF is going back to just talking about, just talking about one of them. Uh, so that same, the same dinner example, we can, we can compute the marginal probability mass function of x and y separately. Um, so again, 
again, if you want to know something about just just x, then I want to I want to add up all the probabilities in this in the in the rows to have some sort of overall probability. Like, what's the probability that the the, the man's dinner equal uh, is is twelve dollars? So you can add up all the all the possibilities that that is the case. Um, so the marginal PMF for x, this is, uh, use the subscript x to denote we're talking about x here. Um, so there's, there's three possible values, right? x can either be um, 12, x can equal 15, or x can equal 20. And for x equals to 12, again, we're just going to add up all those all the cases that here that, that involve x equal to 12. So this is uh, 0.5, sorry, 0 0.05 plus 0.05 plus uh, 0.10, running out of space here, which is 0.2, and that's for x equals 12. Similarly, for x equals 15, we can just add up those three numbers. So 0 0.5 plus 0 0.05 plus 0.1 plus 0 0.35, uh, which gives us 50%. And for x equals to 20, we can just add up those all three numbers in the, the 20 row there, and that'll give us 30%. Kind of going from having information about both of the random variables to kind of collapsing just to look at one of the, one of those random variables. We could do the same thing for y, so pr joint the, the marginal PMF for y again we can now sum over things but now we're going to sum over the columns, right? So if we want something about y equals to 12 we can add up all the first the, the numbers in the first column there so um, 0.05 so now we're talking about a column for y if, um, point one. And similarly, we can uh, do that for the other other two rows there as well. So point three five was fifteen, and point five five y equals twenty. Okay, everyone okay with, with what's going on here? Uh, so using, using our um, marginal PMF for x, we can answer a question like, what's the probability that x is less than or equal to 15? So um, the probability that x is less than or equal to 15, well, that's going to equal, um, that's going to involve the times when x equals 12 or when x equals 15. So that's the marginal PMF uh, at 12 plus the marginal PMF at 15. And looking back at what we just calculated, that's going to be the 0.2 and the 0.5. So this is 0.2 plus 0.5, and that's 70% there. So maybe, I, th I think at this point, you probably could have still looked at the table and we could have, you could have answered this question without maybe discussing marginal distributions, but that's kind of the idea that we're looking at here. And so, so uh, maybe just one other note on where this this terminology comes from. We're talking about it's a marginal PMF. Again, you could think about um, you could also represent that on the table by adding adding sort of total columns on, on the margins of the table. So adding a um, column on the on the far the far right there is the far margin of the table and the on the bottom row as well there. Um, you could just total up these things and that'll, that'll be an equivalent way of representing this. So, um, well those numbers are all wrong, aren't they? That's weird. <laughs> quickly fill these in. Uh, 
zero. So I think that should be, is that, is it right in your notes? I think I have it right, okay. So I'm just adding up the, the rows and columns here, and that's gonna be an equivalent way of thinking about these, these distributions, so 0.35, um, 0.55, <coughs> check that they all add up to one there. So here's my here's my marginal PMF for X and here's my marginal PMF for Y. So and that's kind of where, where the terminology comes from is you're looking at the margin of the table in some sense. <clears throat> okay so that's uh, that's kind of the brief introduction to our terminology for discrete um, two discrete random variables. Let's talk a little bit about um, two continuous random variables. So again, you can probably guess where we're going here. We're going to talk about joint distribution, marginal distribution, same, same kind of things. Um, so again, in switching terminology, now we have a joint uh, probability density function, a joint PDF instead of a joint probability mass function. Uh, we'll go back to using the lowercase f to represent that, and um, that's just a function um, such that we can find probabilities by integrating again. So before we found, in the discrete case, we found probabilities by adding up things. Again, sort of the, the um, analog here is that we're going to do, uh, you can integrate over that density function to find, to find probabilities. So again, the, the density function has to be positive um, or bigger than or equal to zero. And then if you integrate over both x and y, so over the whole thing, you should get an area of one uh, or I guess a uh, volume of one at that point. Um, yeah, so, so maybe now is a good time to note that um, I don't, I think that uh, when this class has been, t well, I, I don't know. So, so the multivariate calculus is not a requirement for this class. Um, so how many of you guys have done double integrals like that? Is that, oh, okay. So, so most of us have at least seen that or okay with that. Um, if you haven't seen that, it, it won't be, we won't, uh, that, that's okay. <laughs> um, but again, the double integral just involves first, first integrating this thing with respect to x and then integrating it with respect to y. Um, that's just kind of what that terminology is. Okay, so th this, this, this bottom line here is, is kind, of, kind of vague, so let's, let's give a specific example. So suppose A is some, some rectangular shape. So I'm looking at all the x values between A and B and all the y values between C and D. If I want to know the probability that, that the the pair x, y is in that set. Um, you can write out the probability like that in interval form, and then I can do my integration over those over those limits. And um, these should be those should be switched. Um, but anyway, so if I want again, kind of thinking about the same idea, if I want the probability of being in a certain range, I just do, take an integral over that over that range of my of my density function. And this, yeah, this may be a good time to, to revisit um, Jamie's question. This, this might be a little bit, again, it's, we're in the three dimensions now, so it's a little more difficult to, to visualize. It's a nice, beautiful plot from your textbook. Um, but again, my, my joint probability density function, my joint PDF, again, is now a function of two inputs. Um, so if you were to try to plot this thing, it would, it would be a three-dimensional plot. Um, you'd have your x, y plane of all your possible values there, and then the density would be, would be that third dimension. Um, and so, so back in chapter four, we talked about air, uh, probability corresponded to area. So, if you had a if you had a curve like this, and you wanted the probability of being in this range, we just found we found an area there. Uh, the extension here is that again, we're now um, going to be looking at at the volume underneath. So, so if that little shaded rectangle equals a, then the probability of being in there is, is the volume of that of that shape underneath the surface. Um, so that's kind of the idea of the double integral will give us that volume. Um, but in any case, same idea that before we looked at um, probability corresponded to area, and now um, probability cor will correspond to, to volume. Um, so I, I don't know if that, that helps you visual th think about what these density functions are going to look like, but it, if you tried to visualize them, it'd be a three-dimensional three -dimensional plot there. Uh, questions, comments? Okay so far? All right. So just, just a quick question before we, before we turn the page. Um, what's the probability that my pair x, y is equal to 
uh, some other single value there. Anybody have an idea? Zero. Zero, yes, exactly. So same idea as before again. Probability in, in this case is now corresponding to volume. So if you think about the volume underneath the density, the, the joint PDF at a particular point, there, there's no volume there. So um, we could rewrite this the probability that x, the pair x, y equals some specific value. That's the same as probability that x equals some value and y equals some value. Is going to equal zero. And again, for the same reason, um, we have a continuous, continuous random variables here, so the probability of equaling a single value is is zero. So again, it's kind of a kind of an interesting idea. So don't don't think about that too hard. Okay, so again, we can now keep talking about the same things as we as we did uh, for the discrete case. Um, I'll have we had marginal PMFs before. Now we have marginal probability density functions. And it's just kind of that same idea. We're going from a, a joint distribution back to just a um, a PDF for one for one random variable. Um, so if I want the marginal PMF for x, I just have to integrate my joint joint density over all possible values of y. So it's kind of like I want to get rid of y from that equation. So I'm going to integrate over all possible values there. Same if I want the marginal PDF of y, I can just integrate over all x values there. So kind of, kind of the same idea. And uh, I guess I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but if you are calculating, so um, if you look at these statements a little more closely, I'm taking an integral over y. So I should be, it's sort of like getting, getting rid of any, any y value that I have floating around in my equation. So when I calculate a, a marginal PDF, it should only involve so up here, it should only involve x. And if I calculate a marginal PDF for y, it should only involve y. It's like you're getting rid of the other variable uh, completely. And kind of think about when you integrate over some variable, it's like you're getting, you're getting rid of all, you're getting rid of that variable at the end. So if you do have an x or y floating around in the uh, marginal PDF for y or x, then you have made a mistake. OK, so example, simple example here. Um, Maybe these two are on a date for Valentine's Day. They've agreed to meet for lunch between noon and 1 o'clock, so they have a one-hour uh, window of time when they're going to meet here. We're going to denote one of their arrival times by x and the other by y, and we're going to um, say they're independent. We'll, we'll talk about that, that more in a little bit. But they have a joint, joint uh, PDF as, as follows here. So when x and y are between 0 and 1 in that one-hour time range, we have some functional value, and it's 0 otherwise. Um, so, again, it's more difficult to draw a picture here. I think I will spare you my three-dimensional drawing. But uh, possible values of x and y are going to be in that, in that um, square of 0, 1 to 0, 1. And then the, the density will be a, a third dimension on top of that there. OK, so uh, let's, just, let's just practice for now in finding a marginal distribution here. Um, so again, writing down the definition from the two slides ago, the marginal distribution of x as I'm taking an integral over over all possible y values. So in general that's over the entire real line of my joint density function with respect to y. Uh, but here it's only non-zero when I'm when y is between 0 and 1. So um, again I'm integrating over all y values so that I can that equality is there because that's the only place that the that f of x y is is bigger than zero. So you can kind of ignore the, the other parts of that integral. Um, so this is integral from zero to one of six x squared y dy. So again, when we have a function of two variables um, and we're integrating res with respect to one of them, you can sort of just assume x is fixed here. And or assume x is a constant and do your integration as usual. So uh, this is just uh, 6x squared times y squared over 2, evaluated at 0 and 1. So I'm just holding that 6x squared constant. And um, 
this is just uh, 3x squared. Um, this is for x between 0 and 1. So that's now my, my marginal PDF of x. And now you could think about questions that we asked before. What's the probability that uh, x is Annie, right? What's the probability that Annie gets there before 1230? Or what's the problem that she gets there after 1245? Any, anything like that. You could use this PDF to answer those types of questions. OK, so that's, that's the corresponding idea for um, two continuous random variables. And we're going to talk about a few more things here. Same ideas as what we've seen before. Uh, so first we can talk about this idea of, of independence. So this, this translates as well. Uh, so two, two random variables, x and y, are independent if, um, so first we're talking about discrete. So when they're discrete, for every pair of x and y, we want the, the joint probability to be equal to the product of the marginal probabilities. So it's kind of the same, the same idea as before when we were looking at events. Uh, A and B are independent if the joint, the probability of A and B um, was equal to the product, probability of A times the probability of B. Um, so you can maybe kind of, kind of see the, the parallel between the rule that we saw back in chapter 3. And, and this idea here is that um, somehow the probability of, of the pair x, y is equal to a product there. So that's when they're discrete. And when they're continuous, um, the idea doesn't translate as directly, but that the idea is that you can factor the, the joint density uh, f of x and y into a product of two marginal densities there. Um, so if they're, if they're independent, then this, then this, then this holds. And, and actually vice versa as well. So if, if you can write, for example, if you can write the joint density function like that, then x and y are also independent. So it is an if and only if statement. And, and just to point out that if, if the, particularly if this statement here for a discrete random variable is not satisfied for every pair of values, um, then they are not independent. We're going to call them dependent in some sense. Um, so yes, yeah, so this, the idea is similar to what we saw with, with uh, when we were looking at sets A and B. Um, again, it's that idea that uh, independence means we can go from a statement about both things to multiplying something together. OK, so going back to our uh, discrete random variable dinner price example, um, thinking about are x and y independent? Um, so if you look back to that, that table, you would need to, to say it. So, so in general, it's going to be easier to say something is not independent. Uh, to say something is dependent, is independent, you have to check sort of all, all combinations. Um, but uh, what we can say here is that so the probability that they were both the dinners were both equal to twelve uh, was 0 0.05. So that's from the from the from the two-way table there, contingency table. Um, and then we found the joint, the joint probability for x of 12. Um, that was 20%. Um, and the joint PMF for y of 12 was equal to 10%. So this is 0 0.2 times 0.1. And those are, these are not equal. So I've found a pair where they're not equal. So what does that mean? Are, are, they, are they independent? No. So since they're not equal, they are um, not independent. So again, it's, for a discrete, it's, it's much easier to say that they are not independent than to go through and check everything there. Yeah, Jim. That's right. Yeah. So it is sufficient to prove dependency by saying not independent. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. 
Okay, so how about our how about our uh, continuous random variable example? Um, so this was uh, f of x y was six x squared y for x and y between zero and one. The marginal p d f of x was three x squared. And we could uh, we could quickly show that so f of the marginal um, PDF of y again that's an integral from zero to one of and dx now we can do that calculation show that that is three y sorry two y. y is between 0 and 1. And so here, here's my joint PDF for, uh, sorry, my marginal PDF for y and my marginal PDF for x. And uh, sure enough, f of xy, which is 6x squared y, is indeed equal to 3x squared times 2y. <coughs> So I can factor my joint distribution in, into my separate, my marginal PDFs. And so therefore are X and Y independent? <coughs> yes, they are. So because I, because I can make this, sort of split these things apart in this way, um, uh, therefore yes. Um, X and Y are independent. And may maybe just to, sorry, to jump back a slide here quick, um, but again, just to kind of talk about this intuitive definition of independence. Again, it is ju just like we saw back when we were talking about probabilities before, it, it's Independence is sort of a, a tricky thing to think about, um, but sort of intuitively it says that knowing, knowing something about one of my random variables um, has no effect on the other random variables. So before we talked about sets, so like our A and B independent, and that was the idea of d knowing something about B, does that change the probability of, of A happening? So it's the same idea here is that if, um, if things are independent, then, then they're unrelated in some sense. So if I know something about X that doesn't really tell me anything about Y, and, and vice versa. Um, so that's that's kind of a, a way to think about this. We can factor things, uh, factor our probabilities like this, um, because they're in some way unrelated to each other. Um, so the same the same intuition is gonna is gonna hold here. Okay, so one more one more continuous example of of independence here. Um, if my joint if my joint density function f of x y is uh, e to the negative x minus y for x and y bigger than zero are x and y independent. So when I, if I'm asking you independence about a a continuous a, a joint continuous PDF here, um, I need to find my marginal distributions. So the marginal for x again, I'm going to take an integral over the real line um, of my joint density. With respect to y, I'm trying to get rid of y from that equation. Um, again, but that, that joint density is only positive for y bigger than 0. So my integral is from 0 to infinity. v to the negative x minus y dy. And I can uh, pull that e to the negative x outside. Because I'm only looking at y, so that's integral of e to the negative y is negative e to the negative y evaluated at zero and infinity uh, which should just be one so that's e to the negative x um, times negative e to the negative infinity um, plus e to the zero so this thing is one so it's just e to the negative x there 
e to the negative infinity is zero, e to the zero is one. Mm -hmm. If we pull the negative out, will that make a difference? If you pull the negative outside, you mean this, this negative here? Yeah. Oh, no, that'll give you the same result. So that'll just be, so over here now this is, um, as I have it currently written, this is um, negative zero plus one, and otherwise you would just get one minus zero, but then it's ne uh, negative one minus, one minus zero, but the negative version of that would be. So, any constants, even after you integrate, just plus. Yep. Okay. Yep. So when you're integrating, constants can go wherever you want them to go. Yep. Yeah, yeah, if you can jump right to the, so if I know what the antiderivative is, yeah, you can jump right to the, right to there. That's fine. Okay, so that's my, this is my marginal PDF for x, so this is for x bigger than or equal to zero. Uh, my marginal PDF for y, it's going to be the same thing. So again, just kind of switch the roles of what we just, what we just did there. Do I have another slide? I do. Okay, so there's my there's my marginal PDFs, and I just want to make sure that I can uh, write my joint distribution in terms of a product here, if they're independent. Um, so, again, f of my density of a, x is e to the negative x. Uh, for y, it's e to the negative y. And sure enough, the joint density And you can write that as e to the negative x times e to the negative y, which is indeed the product of our marginal PDFs. And therefore, are x and y independent? Yes, right. So therefore, again, x and y are, are independent. And uh, just just to make a note and make a connection back to chapter four, that um, does anybody recognize this type of a density function? I know you've all been studying material that was not on the exam, right? <laughs> so this is a this is the PDF for an exponential random variable. So x is an exponential random variable with parameter one there. So. Just uh, drawing a connection back there to what we saw in chapter four. It's the exponential distribution there. Okay, so that's uh, that's the idea of independence, um, and kind of think about how we can show it is by seeing seeing we can factor the joint distribution like like this. Uh, last thing to talk about here in chapter uh, section section one is maybe what you would have expected. So we're now going to talk about uh, conditional conditional distributions. Yeah? Do you have an example where the uh, f of x, y is integrated would not be independent? Yes, I do. Um, so that will be the example we get to in just a second here. So if you look at the bottom of page uh, 6 on your chapter notes, uh, the example exercise 19, page 206, that thing is will not be able to be factored uh, like that, and so we'll we'll, we'll walk walk through that calculation. Um, but yes, it, it is often the case that they are not independent. Um, so we'll look at that here in just a second. Um, yes, so so conditional conditional distributions again. Before we talked about conditional probability, so probability of a given b or something like that. Um, similarly, we can sort of think about talking about a conditional distribution. Um, so first, for my two continuous random variables, if they have a joint PDF f of x, y, and marginal um, PDF f of x, 
Um, then as long as my x is positive, so as long as that, as long as the denominator there is going to be positive, I can write down a conditional distribution, a conditional PDF of y given that x equals some little, some value little x. Um, so the notation is designed to reflect y, it's the distribution of y given x. And sort of same idea as before, I take, I take their joint, their joint probability in some way and I divide by, divide by a marginal probability. So again before it was probability of A given B was a joint probability of A and B, A and B, divided by the probability of B. Kind of think about that the same way. I'm having a joint probability and dividing by a marginal probability. And uh, similar, similar thing holds up for, for two discrete random variables. The, the conditional PMF of Y given that X equals uh, lowercase x. Again, I take a I take a joint probability and I divide by a, a marginal probability, and I, that's okay as long as the denominator is is not zero. So, um, just a little caveat there. And if I want the other way around, so if I want the conditional distribution of x given y, I can just sort of reverse the roles. So I would divide by p of p of y in that case. I'm missing an x subscript there. Um, so sa same idea as before. You can think about conditioning in, in either direction here. Uh, so maybe we won't get to that last example here, we're running low on time, but um, oh, before, before we get to an example, I wanted to just quickly, quickly say this. Um, so you can think about independence in terms of conditional distributions as well here. Um, so two random variables are independent if and only if um, their conditional, the conditional distribution of y given x is just equal to the marginal PDF of y. Um, so the proof, very quick proof here, the, the definition is f of y given x. Uh, by definition is the joint density, f of x, y divided by f of x. So this is by definition. Um, and if, if they're independent, so if they're independent, then I can, I can write the, rewrite the numerator. So the numerator will become f of x, the marginal PDF of x times the marginal PMF, a PDF of y. And now we get some nice canceling going on here. So the x PDFs will go away, and this is just the marginal distribution of y. QED. So again, this would be an equivalent way to show to show independence. Um, you could think about writing the factoring out the joint the joint density, or um, showing the conditional distribution is equal to the marginal. PDF there. Okay, I think we have time to maybe work through this example real quick. Um, back to our, for a discrete example here, back to our dinner price example. Um, so given that the, the man's dinner cost $15, what is the conditional PMF for the price of the woman's dinner? So I want to know the distribution of Y given that X equals 15. Um, so this is, uh, I want the PMF of Y given X, but uh, such that X equals 15. So Y given that X equals 15. And this is going to be the joint density uh, when X equals 15. So the, the joint density of X equals 15 in a generic Y um, divided by the probability that, that X equals 15. So the marginal, uh, the marginal PMF of X is what I want to divide by. So kind of when, when we have the information in a table like this, you can sort of just imagine zooming in on part of the table. So if I assume that the, that the man's dinner, that x equals 15, we kind of just ignore all the other information in this table. So uh, we kind of just focus in on this, on this row and we don't care about the other cases when x equals 12 or x equals 15. 
Um, so here my joint, my conditional um, PMF. I have a, it's the, the joint density is 0.05. Uh, if y equals 12, so then I just need to divide by the probability that x equals 15, which we found previously was uh, 0.5. Um, so that's 0.1. Similarly, we have 0.1 divided by 0.5. Um, so it's 0.2 if y is 15. And finally, we have 0.35 divided by 0.5, uh, which is 0.7 if y equals 20. So you can kind of just zoom in on a part of the table, but then we want to make sure that that adds up to zero. So um, divide each number there sort of by the, by the row total, kind of what we're doing there. Okay, and maybe just to wrap things up, finish out this example. Uh, so that was my conditional PMF. So that's my conditional dens uh, distribution of y given that x equals 15. And I can use that to, to calculate a probability. So again, this is kind of probably kind of a overly simple example, but um, the probability that y is less than or equal to 15 given that x equals 15. Um, well, again, that equals, there's two, two cases that, that can happen. So that's either y equals 12, given that x equals 15, um, or y equals 15, given that x equals 15. And so I'm just adding up my conditional probabilities here of 12, given that, um, that x equals 15. And then a 15, given that x equals 15. So this is just 0.1 plus 0.2, 30% there. I'm using that conditional PDF, PMF that I calculated on the previous page and just adding up two of those, two of those results. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, have a great weekend, and we'll uh, we'll see you on Monday. <laughs>